As we come to worship God on this Sunday morning, hear these words from the breastplate of St. Patrick. I rise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak to me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me. Let us worship God together. Christ be beside me, Christ be before me, Christ be behind me. Be within me, Christ be below me, Christ be above me, never to part. Christ on my Christ in 
in my setting, Christ in my rising, light of my be the vision in eyes that see me, in ears that hear me, Christ ever be. My sisters and brothers in Christ, on this fourth Sunday of Lent, with continued faith and humility, let us make our honest confession before God. Let us pray. Hear and believe the good news, the promise of the gospel. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Thanks be to God for this unspeakable gift. Know this day that you are forgiven. Be at peace then, and pray also for me, a sinner. Amen. Friends, I don't know about you, but these warmer days have just lifted my spirits a little. And I hope and pray that that is true for you and that as one season turns to the next, we give back prayers of thanks and gratitude to God who has just been with us steadily in every season. Just a couple of announcements for you today. Our online cheese tasting with our friends from Fourchette is taking place next Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. So if you want to be a part of that, please let me know by the end of the day today so we can get that order in. And our children's ministry is hosting an Easter egg hunt. We extended the deadline, so if you missed that and you want to be a part of that Easter egg hunt on March 27th, we'd love to have you be a part of, a, part of that. Just drop us a line at the church office. We're also preparing Holy Week at home bags with just some useful items and reflections as we walk through Holy Week apart from one another. If you'd like to receive one of those, again, just drop a line to the church office. And you know, our hopeful plans for Easter are to be together if that is possible and also to have an online and pre-recorded service. So keep that in mind as we move forward. 
And before we turn to the children's conversation this morning, I just want to, to pause and acknowledge that this week marks one year of worshiping online. I don't know how you have marked out this week, if at all, maybe just remembering, oh, this was the last time I did this and the last time I, I did that. And there's a certain tenderness that comes with that. We did not expect it to be this long and yet, and yet. So I wanted to pause and I would like to invite you to simply join with me in prayer in a very short liturgy in which I borrow some words from Julian of Norwich. Julian was a 14th century mystic who famously penned these words, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And do you know, Julian of Norwich lived in isolation during a pandemic. Let's pray together. Remembering a year of grief, a year of sorrow, a year of uncertainty, we pray that all shall be well. With hope on the horizon and the battle still raging, we pray that all shall be well. We search for patience, we long for what was. Still, we know you were never far away. And we pray that all will be well. Marking this year of pandemic, trusting in your faithfulness, we pray that all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Amen. Well, top of the morning to you. Do you know that that is one way that people might say hello in Ireland? And another way to say it, a way that my family would probably use more, is sometimes people say, what about you? What about you? So why am I talking in all of these Irish phrases? Well, maybe you've seen lots of these around and lots of these around, some rainbows and some shamrocks. And why is that? Why is that? You're right, because St. Patrick's Day is coming up in just a few days, and maybe you're making a leprechaun trap at home or at school, or you're hoping that you'll find some gold coins. Well, I wanted to let you know this day, as we think about leprechauns and shamrocks and rainbows, that St. Patrick was a real person now a saint, a real person who lived a long, long time ago. Now, you probably are thinking that St. Patrick was Irish. Am I right? Right. But St. Patrick, you know, he wasn't Irish. He was actually British. And the story goes that he was captured from his home when he was young. He was captured from his home and he was taken to Ireland where he lived and he worked as a slave. St. Patrick was actually a shepherd and that is a good job to have in Ireland because there are a lot of sheep in Ireland. Well, anyway, St. Patrick had been captured from his home in England and brought to Ireland. He was a slave and he was working as a shepherd. He managed to escape and go back to his home in England. But you know that he hadn't been there too, too long before God called him to be a missionary, a missionary, someone who goes out to tell about God's love. And God called him to be a missionary, not in England, but in Ireland. 
And so even though the people in Ireland had not been very kind to St. Patrick, he still felt called to go and to share God's love with them. And he was one of the very first people to share that news about God's great big love in Ireland. And because of him, people came to know Jesus, and people cared for each other, and they built churches, and they kept telling that story of Jesus' love over and over and over again. And now everywhere that you go in Ireland, and I hope that you'll get there one day, there are lots and lots of churches and lots and lots of people who love Jesus. And I like to remember that that is due in part to St. Patrick. So I hope that you will have a happy St. Patrick's Day and maybe you'll eat some Lucky Charms. I don't know, let me know if you catch a leprechaun. And maybe on St. Patrick's Day, we could all pause to say a prayer and to thank God for people like St. Patrick who tell others about Jesus' love. And maybe we can be those people too. Let's say we pray together, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for St. Patrick, that he was kind even when others were unkind, that he spoke of your love when others only spoke unkind things. Help us to be more like that and to share the story of Jesus and of his love for all children everywhere. This we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. I'll be reading from John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that he, or that the world might be saved through him. Those that believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only son of God and that this, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come into the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. That was a pretty packed passage of scripture that Carrie read for us this morning, wasn't it? And that mention of a snake in the first verse, well, that is enough to just send a cold chill just running down my spine and cause the whole rest of that reading to just be completely lost in me. I do not like snakes. But if I had to venture a guess this morning, I would say that there's at least one verse in there which was not lost on any of us but may have instead long reverberated in our ears and in our hearts. That verse, of course, is John 3.16. Martin Luther once referred to it as the heart of the Bible, the gospel in miniature, he wrote. How does it go? Maybe like me, you committed it to memory in the good old King James version of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have 
everlasting life. I think I was about eight years old when I first memorized that verse and I have very vivid memories of doing so and subsequently I have very clear associations with that particular verse. I suspected that I wasn't the only one. In fact, just last week as part of a project that I'm working on for one of my DMIN classes, I did a little crowdsourcing among my Facebook friends. What I did was I posted a picture of a John 316 sign and I simply asked churchy and non-churchy friends because I didn't just want to hear from my churchy friends. I wanted to hear from a wider spectrum. Churchy and non-churchy friends, what comes to mind when you hear, see, or read John 316? Thoughts memories, feelings. It brought to mind football fanatics and Jesus-loving football fans with large signs. It brought to mind Tim Tebow. It brought to mind for others a Keith Urban song, and despite my fondness for country songs, this was a new one for me, so I looked it up. This is how it goes. And I learned everything I needed to know from John Cougar, John Deere, and John 316. It brought to mind for others memories of being taught this verse by beloved grandfathers and grandmothers. For my friend Karen, who gave me permission to share her story today, it brought to mind memories of her father. It was her father's favorite verse, you see, and he recited it often through a 13-month-long battle with cancer. He succumbed to that disease on March 16th, 316. After his funeral, they had a lunch on the water in Ches Chesapeake City that was his favorite place. And the maximum capacity sign for patrons there 316. A reminder, she said, that God was always with them, a verse that found her in her grief, a gift and a grace. For God so loved the world. For some, it seems this is a verse that heals. For others, though, John 316 is a verse which hurts it touches on pain points in their life, a problematic theology which had wounded them and which they are still trying to undo or come to terms with. Many of those stories of pain, they came under cover of private messages. For God so loved the world, yeah, my friends told stories of images writ large in their minds of protesters who held a John 3.16 sign in one hand and a message of condemnation for the LGBTQ community in the other. For God so loved the world, yet friends spoke of how they find themselves in the outs of their church community when they voiced care for refugees and for immigrants. For God so loved the world, as long as you are on the correct side of the political aisle, whatever side you deem that to be. For God so loved the world, as long as you didn't express any doubts or fears about faith or about God. It's, for some, an if-then sort of love. If-then. If you love the right people, believe the right things, say the right prayer, then you too can be part of this world which God loves. If. A world, a word which heals and a word which hurts. It was a word which first came to Nicodemus one night and you remember Nicodemus, don't you? He was a leader of the Jews, a Pharisee. 
He knew all about living by the letter of the law. The letter of the law was his life breath. I wonder why he came to see Jesus that night. Had he heard about this rabbi who turned water into wine to make out of a marriage feast a celebration? That doesn't sound very circumspect, does it? Had he heard of this same rabbi overturning tables in the temple as if making a way for all to enter? Was Nicodemus exhausted by the exacting standards he held himself to, afraid to let down his guard for fear that the real him wouldn't be welcomed in the light of day? Was that the reason that he came under cover of darkness? So that he wouldn't be seen? I don't know the answers to any of those questions. But I get the sense that Nicodemus was someone who wanted to get it just right. His devout life of faith appears to have been transactional in many ways. Follow the rules, get the reward. Follow the rules, get the reward. Don't follow the rules, be prepared for the consequences. Have you ever thought of God that way? Maybe what Nicodemus hoped to take away from his nighttime encounter was a playbook of sorts, a set of rules to live by. A set of rules to live by. But what is on offer that night and this day is instead an invitation to relationship that's centered in love. I hope that Nicodemus heard those words, for God so loved the world, and then kept on listening. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Why did Jesus come? not to exclude or divide or reject or condemn, but to love and to save. His whole life bears witness to this love in all of its fullness, all the world, all its people, especially the ones on the edge, especially the overlooked, especially the pushed down, especially the curious questioners, especially the ones who came to him under cover of darkness. Oh, that we would live and move and have our being with the vision of this rabbi, a loving, a saving vision. That would certainly keep those snakes at bay, wouldn't it? How would it be a church like that? Friends, you know, because I mentioned it a little bit earlier this morning, that we have been doing church like this now for exactly one year, 52 Sundays. You on one side of the screen, me on the other. I don't know who is tuning in today. Some of your faces certainly are familiar to me, and I miss you. I know I've said that before. I'm going to keep on saying it. I'm eager for us to find our ways to times of safe regathering, I'm eager for us to live into the saving love of God and Jesus in real and concrete ways. And do you know what? That's going to stretch us. But the love is big enough and maybe we need to be stretched. Others of you who are tuning in today, I don't know. You find your way to church or back to church during this time of pandemic the virtual place, a safe space to engage or to reconnect. And I'm grateful that you're here this morning. 
Maybe like Nicodemus, you are laboring under the weight of your own questions about God and faith and the church and if you'll fit in. If you find your way to our church during this time, I want to tell you that you have found an imperfect church. And I'm sort of glad that we're that way because if we were perfect, I'd have to leave for one in order for us to stay that way. We are imperfect. But I also believe that here at Clinton Presbyterian Church, we are a place and a people where hurts might be healed by the power of a love which has room enough for you and for me and for all who would come. For all. Lent is a really good time for us to confess and repent of all of the ways in which we have made this love too rigid, too transactional, and far, far too small. The heart of the gospel is a big love. Not love the size of a country song or billboard size love, but much, much bigger than that. It's a love that took on flesh and blood and moved right into the neighborhood. And it shook that neighborhood up, and heaven knows the neighborhood needed it. It's a love that changed Nicodemus's life. It changed my friend Karen's life. It changed my life. And if we allow it, if we allow it, it's a love that can still change the world. And heaven knows we need it. So may it be so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.
Turn our hearts to prayer. Please remember and pray for Karen and Larry on the loss of Karen's father, Albert. When you hear me say, the day of the Lord is coming, I invite you to respond with, he abounds in steadfast love. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, when we feel that we have lost direction as a people, or even as a person, Help us remember your presence in our wilderness journeys. The day of the Lord is coming. He abounds in steadfast love. Great Deliverer, your steadfast love and wonderful works have spared us of troubles known and unknown, for you are in love with us. The day of the Lord is coming. He abounds in steadfast love. Holy Spirit, help us remember the great work that Christ accomplished for us, which no other person could perform. Help us confess with gladness, by grace we have been saved. The day of the Lord is coming, he abounds in steadfast love. Lord Jesus Christ, gift of mercy from God the Father, you love us even when we are the most unlovable, lost, and afraid. Thank you for your grace. The day of the Lord is coming. He abounds in steadfast love. Lord Jesus Christ, lifted up on the cross like the serpent in the wilderness, lift up our eyes to see you as the Lord and Savior, loving God's whole world. The day of the Lord is coming. He abounds in steadfast love. We bring before you those whom you love with special needs this day, known to us as family and friends who we name in our hearts now. The day of the Lord is coming. He abounds in steadfast love. Though we remember we are dust, and to dust we shall return, we remember that we are your precious dust. We lift these prayers up to you, Lord Jesus, praying the words that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen Friends, I bless you now as you head into this day with these words. 
once again from St. Patrick. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye of everyone who sees me, Christ in the ear of everyone who hears me. Friends, may your day be filled with God's nearness. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon and abide with you and all those who you love this day and forever and ever. Amen and amen. Thank you.